Which brings us to the Dominion Mandate. <laughs> now, first of all, I want to point out these two words, Dominion and Mandate. The word Mandate, you've got to understand, Mandate means an authoritative order or command. It doesn't mean a good idea. It doesn't mean a suggestion. It means an authoritative order. Dominion has to do with control. Dominion has to do with rulership. Dominion has to do with authority and subduing. And it relates to society. The, one of the last things that Eleanor danced to uh, were the words, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In other words, what is talked about, what, what, what the values are in heaven need to be made manifest here on earth. Dominion means being the head and not the tail. Domin dominion means ruling as kings. It says in Revelation chapter 1, 6 that he has made us kings and priests. And check the rest of that verse. It says for dominion. So we are kings for dominion. Now the dominion mandate is another phrase for the Great Commission. And we're, we're, most of us are more familiar with the term Great Commission, uh, but now we've got to understand that the dominion mandate is, is another way of saying the Great Commission, because when Jesus sent his disciples out, he said he told them to go and make disciples of all nations. Now get that idea, make disciples of what? All nations. It doesn't say in this point, it doesn't other places, it doesn't say at that scripture to make disciples of individuals out there. It says make disciples of whole nations. Those are whole groups of society. In other words, it's talking about transforming society. So what I want to do is I want to go to the Word and explore this in just a few minutes, and I'm going to, I'm going to do it in four points, because when you go home and you tell and your people, say, what happened at starting the year off right, you're going to say, well, a lot of people talked about dominion. Then they're going to say, dominion, what's that? Okay, so I'm going to give you. I'll give, I'll give you four points that you can, just, you can just write these down and explain. And that makes sense. I'm not saying this is anything you don't know, but I'm just, I'm just putting it together in a package for you so you can see the, the whole picture. So the first point, number one, is dominion theology begins on the first page of the Bible. I'll say the, I'll say the title slow so you can write them down. Dominion theology begins on the first page of the Bible. Now what do I mean? I mean that by, I mean by Adam and Eve. God creating Adam and Eve. And I mean, he created the whole universe. He created everything first. And then on the last day, before he rested on the last day, he created Adam and Eve. And, that, and Adam and Eve are uh, humans. He created human beings in his image. And you probably know that the word Adam is another name for the whole human race. So we were, he created all of us actually in seed when he created Adam and Eve. And he created them. The reason he did that as best we can understand God from his word is that he wanted to create people in his image who could love him and serve him and with whom he could relate personally. So he had a plan for what they should do once he made them and they got on earth and that's on the first page of the Bible and I'll, I'll just read this scripture Genesis 1 28 after he created Adam and Eve he said God bless them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion. Everybody say dominion. dominion. Have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So God created Adam and Eve to have dominion. He created us to have dominion because we were in Adam and Eve, and that is our dominion mandate. Now the thing is that Adam had, God delegated to Adam a lot of authority. He had authority to take dominion, right? You know what else he had authority to do? He had authority to give his dominion away. That's how much authority he had. Which brings us to number two. Number two, the enemy has attacked the dominion mandate since day one. I just told you about day one. The enemy has attacked the dominion mandate since day one because Satan in the form of a serpent entered the Garden of Eden for one main reason, and that is to usurp the dominion that God had designed for Adam. Now what was Satan's situation? You know this, he was created an angel, an angel of light, one of the names was Lucifer, and a wonderful, wonderful angel, but through pride he decided to take dominion over God. Now that didn't work. And so God cast him out of heaven. And when God did, see when Satan was in heaven, get this now, he had both 
power and authority. When he was cast to earth, he still had his power, but he lost his authority. Now, that was very, very frustrating from Satan. And let me just you say, well, how can you have one or the other? Well, I, just as a good illustration, um, I own a gun. I live in Colorado Springs, okay? I own a gun. That's a lot of power. I own it. I've got shells for it, okay? However, I can't use that gun in Colorado Springs. Why? Well, I have the authority, but I can't use I have the power, but I can't use it. Why? Because I don't have what? I don't have the authority to use that gun in Colorado Springs. If I were a police officer, I would have both the power and the authority to use that gun. That's, that's just the picture of Satan. Now back to Satan. What did Satan want more than anything else? Satan wanted to regain the authority that he lost and he wanted to maintain it. That's why Satan approached Adam and Eve. Because Adam and Eve had authority to take dominion and he had an authority to give his dominion away. Adam could obey God or he could obey Satan. He was made what we call a free moral agent. So he made the worst choice and he gave his dominion to Satan. And what did that do? That put us who were in Adam at that time under the dominion of Satan. So now we live a couple thousand years, even after Christ, and uh, sometimes we forget how miserable the earth was before Christ. I won't go into this. I've got a lot of notes here, but I've only got a few minutes. But I just, get, I just want to get these ideas out. Satan, Satan has taken in thousands of years of history of the world great pleasure in seeing human beings suffer. That, that gives him pleasure. That's why the Bible calls Satan the God of this age. Did you hear those words? I didn't, I'm not making these up. The Bible says Satan's the God of this age. It says he's the prince of the power of the air. It says he's the ruler of the world. I won't stop and talk about each one of these, but that's why, that's why the Bible says that Satan has come to steal, to kill, and to destroy. The more he steals, the more he kills, the more he destroys, the happier he is. And, um, and um, uh, the, tr Satan has, has usurped from Adam tremendous authority and dominion. But that's not the way that God originally planned the world. And God has done something about that, which is point number three. The second Adam permanently reversed history. That's point number three. The second Adam permanently reversed history. First Adam did it as well. And if you look at the big picture of the world, I don't know if you ever thought of this, but God's created world changed direction 180 degrees twice. First change 180 degrees when Adam gave up his dominion and his authority. That's 180 degrees in what God wanted. And then when the second Adam came, it changed 180 degrees and now it's back on course. Now it's not finished yet. Jesus, when he came, he turned history back again, but it's not finished. So why did Jesus come? It says in 1 John 3, 8, for this purpose, the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. The works that the devil had been doing, Jesus came to destroy these works of the devil. Chuck, I thought you were going to say something. Just going to give something, all right? Good. Now here's what Jesus said. You know, these, you know this scripture, it's in Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, a lot of our minds, we've been hearing preaching as if that said, Jesus came to save those who were lost. It's not what that says exactly. It says to save that which was lost. What was lost? The dominion was lost in the Garden of Eden. One of the differences, Dutch Sheets uh, the other night uh, uh, contrasted the difference between pastoral ministry and apostolic ministry. Not, there's not one bad or one good, it's just that there are different kinds of ministries. And pastoral preaching stresses Jesus' death on the cross as paying the penalty for our sins so we can go to heaven. Now that's true, that's very true. If, we didn't, if Jesus didn't die on the cross, we couldn't go to heaven. And that's, that's how pastors mostly uh, preach Jesus' death on, on um the cross. But apostolic preaching takes that verse literally. And apostolic teaching, Jesus came to save that which was lost, literally the dominion that, uh, that Adam uh, gave up 
in the Garden of Eden is now being uh, restored. And so how does God the Father see this? It says in Colossians 1, For it pleased the Father that in him all the fullness should dwell, and by him, that's Jesus, to reconcile all things to himself. Do you get that phrase? See? All things. Now that includes people. But it includes much more than people, everybody. To reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of the cross. So Jesus paid the price of reconciliation. God gave us the task of actually making it happen, which leads to the fourth point, which is the, the last one, okay? The last one, number four, is that Jesus delegated establishing his kingdom to us. What do I mean? To you and to me. We are the ones who are, the, the, who are supposed to bring this about. See, Jesus tra trained his disciples to take charge after he left. Acts 1.8, you all know this. But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the ends of the earth. What did Jesus mean by, by my, be my witnesses? He meant that we are to be people who would speak and act on Jesus' behalf. As if Jesus himself were doing it, Jesus wants us to do that. And so he announced his agenda in his first sermon public message that he ever gave in the synagogue of Nazareth after his uh, baptism and temptation, where he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He's anointed me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable, year of the Lord. Every part of what I just said upsets the devil. He isn't like a single part of that. Because since the, gar since, 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 the, because it, since the Garden of Eden, he had taken dominion and he had done just the opposite of everything that Jesus declared. So since that day, Jesus has been using his witnesses, including who? You, including me, to build his church, to advance his kingdom, and to reconcile more and more of creation to himself. And how, what's the devil doing in the meantime? It says in Revelation 12, 12, for the devil has come down to you having great wrath because he knows he has a short time. He has a much shorter time than he had 2,000 years ago. And the, and, and the time is coming when the devil is being pushed back. So what I believe is in 2000, uh, this is kind of sort of a prophetic word, see? Satan, let me just read this so I get the wording right. Satan has been losing ground for 2,000 years. But, prophetically, the process is about to speed up. Now I say this, Satan will lose more ground in the next hundred years than he lost in the past 2000. It's probably conservative prophecy, but I think that's going to happen. In the, as I mentioned, we, the year 2001, open the second apostolic age. The government of the church is now in place. We're aligning with apostles and prophets. And this, this war that we're in, that we have talked about, has two fronts. It has a spiritual front and it has a natural front. And um, in the spiritual front, it says we must stand against the wiles of the devil. What are the wiles of the devil? The wiles of the devil are anything that he does to maintain the dominion that he, that he stole from Adam in the Garden of Eden. And what does that mean? Spiritual warfare. Satan's, got, Satan's mad, he's angry, he's trying to maintain it, and so we're at warfare. This is spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but we wrestle, wrestle against principalities and powers. That's the, that's the spiritual front, but we better not stay there. We better bring it down to the natural front. And that's what all the dancing us, as Robert's gonna talk about, we're gonna talk about bringing it to earth. And this is the new cutting edge for this generation. God is revealing powerful concepts for us, which I don't have time to explain. Some of you will know what I'm talking about, and if you don't, you're gonna hear about them real soon. Or get my book um, called Dominion. We're all out now, I even had to give my copy away. But uh, get my book uh, Dominion, and um, a lot of this is spelled out. But one of the things God has given us is the 7M mandate regarding the seven mountains. 
No time to explain it. He's given us the teaching of the church in the workplace, which Chuck uh, referred to uh, during the ordination, and this is extremely important. He's given us the he's given us the teaching of having of of knowing that he's placed apostles in the workplace, not just. Uh, in the uh, nuclear church. And he's also given us revelation of the crucial role of wealth. We will not see sustained transformation of cities or nations without controlling vast amounts of kingdom wealth. Those are carefully chosen statements, vast amounts of kingdom wealth.